It's the Waiting for Next Year dot com podcast. Dave Sterling, how's it going, sir? Going well. How about yourself? It's going awesome. Before we get started, um, I want I want some feedback. I want some feedback from the people who are listening to the podcast. We recently did a survey, and it's come to my t- first of all. Thank you to all of you for for listening. I know you were out there. I see the numbers. You guys are out there. You're listening. Um, but it it uh, there's only probably a little bit of crossover between the listeners and the reading audience because the people who filled out the survey, the vast majority of them are not listening to the podcast and don't really listen to podcasts, period. Huh. But that doesn't mean we don't have a healthy number of listeners to the podcast anyway. It's just a smaller sub-niche. And most of the people who listen to the podcast aren't listening via the website itself. They yes. listen via iTunes and whatnot. But I want your feedback. I've created a WFNY podcast Facebook page when I post this to Waiting for Next Year. I don't want you to comment on the content. I just want you to say, hi. <laughs> I, want to, I, just, I, want, I want to see who's out there. I just want to say hello because I know you are, but it's not like when, when we write content for Waiting for Next Year, it almost begs people to jump in and discuss. But when we're doing this – we talk about so many different things. If somebody comments, they might be commenting on something we talked about between minute five and, and five, 30, five minutes and 37 seconds, and the context is lost because it's not live. Yes. So anyway, Dave Sterling, how are you doing? We, we I just found out it. about this Waiting for Next Year podcast Facebook page, so I just went and liked it. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I well here's here's the other thing that was happening every time I recorded a podcast the service that I po- post the podcast to would upload something to um the waiting for next year Facebook page and it confused people and then I'd post it to waiting for next year as a post later and then that would post as well and so I was double posting podcasts to the waiting for next people don't care people well, don't care uh, well I, this is something interesting um <clears throat> that I just learned uh, from our friend Scott. Uh, he posted an article on the podcast uh, little page today that said more than 80% of mobile podcast listeners use Apple devices. Right. And you're an Android man. I'm an Android man. And, and, and it makes me think that this thing that I've been doing for several years, like I started into podcasts mainly um, – Jeez, it has to be seven or so years ago because I really got into them when uh, I when I was dating my now wife, Mary Ellen, I had an hour drive to Bay Village. And there's only so much uh, talk radio you can listen to, uh, right. you know, music after a while. You know, you want to just hear something more engaging for the long drive. So I got into Scarborough Country was the first podcast. And so to me, podcasts are just, oh, second nature. But then more and more I've talked about it to other people. They're like, now, how do I get that? And See, and this is this is me back in, I, I believe, in 2001 or 2002. It was probably December of 2001 when I started my first blog. And I remember people being confused about it and whatever else. I think more people are aware of podcasts, but I think we're still in that same blog zone, 2002 blog zone in terms of actual people actually using them or looking at them. Like right. back then, my mom knew what a blog was because I told her, but she certainly didn't read any. She read The Plain Dealer on the web or cleveland.com or, you know. Right. She was she was years away from her first social network, and now everybody's grandma and is on Facebook. Let alone my parents, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I I guess I'm not shocked that the majority of people are Apple device users because Apple's native app is still pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's a great app. How would you and- know? <laughs> <laughs> Because I used to use it on an iPod Touch. Um, but, yeah, it's – and that's one thing that Google had fairly early with Android was they had an app called Listen. And then they kind of abandoned it. And I don't – I'm not quite sure why. 
I guess they assumed that Apple was handling it. So now there's a couple of good podcasters out there for Android, but it's it's just not kind of as integrated into the fabric of the phone as much as it is. You kind of have to seek it out. Like even even the Google Listen app back when it was uh, still you know relevant wasn't yeah. preloaded. You had to go out and find it and. It's well, just interesting, those things that you think, oh, yeah, of course everyone does that. Well, and but- see, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lover of Google. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, certainly, Gmail and Google Calendar rule my world um, right. between the two of them. And yet, I, I find myself getting mad at Google all the time, and it's totally unfair. But I get mad at them for not doing things. Or, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like I'm – like, Google should have taken over. They should have. They should have been first to Spotify. They should have been first to this. They should have been first to that. The one that makes me the maddest, the most angry, is the fact that they didn't just blow Directv out of the water, bidding for NFL Sunday ticket. Yeah, and just so, sell it to everybody. Everybody with an internet connection can buy NFL Sunday ticket for three hundred dollars, um, and untie that thing from satellite service. That would have made me the happiest person in the world. It would have been the. It would have been huge market disruption. It would have changed the game, literally. Ha 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 ha. Uh, um, ha ha ha. Yeah, that was so bad. I didn't even mean to do it, but I'm embarrassed anyway. So yeah, Google makes me mad for the things that they won't do with their massive resources. <laughs> That's an odd reason to be mad at a company. <laughs> well, they, they should just put me in charge of a fifty million dollar budget, or something. All right, I can see that. Right? You trust me. Yeah, yeah. You'll. <laughs> you could be my vice president of the $50 million budget. We'll figure right, it out. I, I'm, I'm with you on uh, on the, the NFL Sunday ticket thing, and I will go ahead with new podcast app. Those are the first two projects. And then well, after that, I'm not I sure think... what $50 million gets us. Yeah, I don't know. I... Hmm. I'm going to think about it. Yeah, uh, maybe now is not the best time to think about it. No, probably not. Um, uh, so anyway, this is also kind of the sports dead season. Ugh, yeah. Sorry, Indians, but it, you even had an off night tonight. It's just there's just nothing to talk about. When we were talking about the Indians behind the scenes, and I won't out anybody or out the exact conversation, but. It, is there seems to be some debate over whether the Indians hmm, there something with their attitude. I wrote that long thing about Mark Shapiro in his interview with Marla Reidenauer. Just and I didn't even focus on Mark Shapiro and his actual job performance, other than his public facing PR. And it still felt like there was lots and lots of debate over it. Yeah, I, I'm with you on it. I, I don't like to be talked to like I'm an idiot that doesn't understand. You know what I mean? I understand that the Yankees spend more than you. I get it. Like, you don't need to go, well, if I had that kind of budget, I could do that. But, of course, of course, you laymen don't know what we have to go through. Yeah, you have to run a baseball team. I understand that. That's your job. I do a, a job that's, you know different and i get rewarded differently your job is to run a baseball team so don't talk to me like i'm an idiot because you think i don't understand the realities of your universe or whatever have you thought at all about like what mark shapiro could or should have said about the message like just in general i mean did did you read the interview uh not the entire thing i think i read part one all right I would, do, you, do you think you can conduct the interview? I want to pretend to be Mark Shapiro. You want to be Mark Shapiro? I do. All right. <laughs> I, I now now you're Mark going, Shapiro. wait a minute. No, I got to interview I kinda, Mark Shapiro. I kind of wanted to be Mark Shapiro. Well, maybe, no, uh, maybe you can be Mark Shapiro later. <laughs> okay, deal, deal. <laughs> or maybe I should be. Maybe you should be Mark Shapiro first because I might be better prepared with the questions. <laughs> No, you should do it real first, and then I'll be angry, Mark Shapiro. <laughs> okay. Uh, we did this one other time. I don't remember who it was, uh, who I was being. 
Anyway, hi, uh, Mark. Thanks for, thanks for coming down here to the Beacon Journal building. Uh, no problem. I'm really excited to talk to you about the, the 2015 Cleveland Indians. Uh, great, great. Uh, so, finally, uh, this off season, you seemed like you've added a couple of pieces. They don't really seem to be coming together. Uh, what What do you have to say about that? Yeah, you know, we're we're not exactly excited with where we are right now, but we think we should be a lot better. We think we can be a lot better. The the key thing to an off season like the Indians had, like we've had with the Indians, is that we've got a lot of players that other teams would have loved to go buy in free agency. But because of the draft, because of how our farm system developed and our, our getting young guys on long-term deals, Michael Brantley, Jason Kipnis, Corey Kluber, guys like that, they never hit the open market. So I think we've put a team together that should be able to compete for a World Series this year right now. Well, why don't you think they are competing for that this year right now? You know, baseball's a long season. There are a lot of factors that go into it. And, and I, you know, I, I don't know that I can get into a specific with each and every player, but I think overall we've just got some underperformers up and down the roster. And if they if they play up to their potential, which I know they can do, I really think we can get back in this race and make a, a serious dent in the playoffs, especially with the way we're pitching. You mentioned pitching. Why would you mention pitching? Well, I mean, with... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Did you really uh, want me to answer that? No, I didn't. Uh, real question. Marla, Marla, I don't appreciate that question. Sorry, I, you know. Why are you uh, giving Marla a deep voice? Because I'm not going to mock someone's voice that I don't know what they sound like. Until I do Mark Shapiro. Okay. Uh, uh, last question of part uh, nine of the interview. Aren't you going to ask me if we should go try and get some free agents at the trade deadline? Oh, f- yeah, hold on. <laughs> Listen, Mark, <laughs> trade deadline's coming up. Uh, oh, what, is it? What, I just read it on uh, Deadspin <laughs> that the trade line is coming up. Did you hear about uh, Gawker? No, I, <laughs> I read on BuzzFeed Sports that the trade deadline's <laughs> coming up, and I read the top ten targets for all teams. What are do you have some big plans to you know make the big playoff push at the trade deadline this year? You know, every trade deadline, every year, we explore a number of different opportunities. And uh, I I certainly think that we'll leave no stone unturned this year as well because it would be a real shame uh, if we didn't try and do something to support this pitching staff the way they've been pitching all year. This is a... this kind of pitching performance deserves to be invested in, and we're going to do everything in our power to try and invest in this pitching staff this year because uh, you know our record, while it, it's lacking right now, we think it can be a lot better, and we think we can do some serious damage if we just find a way into the playoffs. One last question. Did I pump you up yet? Go I'm ahead. kind of pumped up. Terry okay. Francona has been called the most huggable manager in all of baseball. But the team's problems seem to be motivation related. What do you think uh, that has to do with our manager and what uh, remedies do you see for that going forward this season? Well, I think anybody who thinks Terry Francona is a problem doesn't understand baseball. I think Terry Francona is one of the very best managers in the entire league, in the entire game of baseball, and, and we're lucky to have him. So what would you put the performance issues upon? Oh, I just think it's a couple of guys who maybe uh, aren't playing up, up to, to no good. <laughs> a couple of guys who are not playing up to their level, um, but I certainly think they can. They're all. Uh, we've got a capable player at every position right now, and that's it. And that's per- that's yeah, that's way better than the version I'm about to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not about to do a version like that. But yeah, uh, yeah, that's way easier than going. You idiots just don't get it. The market they don't realities. give me any money. Yeah. Well, and I guess you could have asked me about attendance too. I didn't even think about that. But um, I'm not putting a team out there until you assholes start showing up. No. I, yeah. Exa- well, I would have. You know. <laughs> this is my angry, angry Shapiro. <laughs> I need to go back through the archives and see who who the uh, who the other major uh, sports <laughs> player in Cleveland that I uh, imitated. But yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think of like how dangerous your answers could get if you only know like three players or four players. <laughs> tr- how, mu- how much of the roster do you know? Uh, uh, I know a good amount of it. You know, 
it's that's the funny thing. It's like this is a sports podcast, but Julio I specific- Franco still play. I specifically <laughs> wanted you to come and and join this podcast, not because of your sports stuff at all. <laughs> well, if you were going to catch me on the sports stuff that I don't have, it unfortunately is the Indians. Like I can, right. I can talk legit sports about the Cavs and the Browns. I I just have trouble. I don't have the time commitment to put into to baseball. I'm afraid. Well, and especially, I mean, that that big story came out about the TV ratings dropping for the Indians, and that's just a bad comparison because the Indians' uh, TV ratings were monster last year, and this year they couldn't compete with the Cavs' playoff run. Yeah. And so it's just like it's not even meaningful. It's just common sense. And, and the Indians are, are likely doing just fine on TV considering the way they've played. That's the other thing that really bugs me is like – you know, winning is the only thing that matters, okay? So the Indians haven't won enough games yet. But Correct. But they are winning a lot of games recently, and that should be all that matters, except it's really, really boring to watch. I mean, the Indians won a game yesterday with with four runs off bases loaded walks, right? Yes. Something crazy like that. And it, I know that's remarkable, but it's remarkable in a box score later. It's not remar- It's not fun to watch. Yeah, it's great to he- great to read that the next morning. We, oh, Indians won. Huh. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather them not like defy statistics in weird ways. I'd rather them just hit like a softball team. How about that? Right. Or if they're gonna do stuff weirdly, like do it flamboyantly. You know, nobody. Yeah, like you said, nobody cares of. Well, this hasn't happened since 1878. And just That's- for anybody who is confused, this is not Indians' hate. This is Indians' love. Damn it! This is this is how it manifests itself when I'm frustrated. Um, this is me caring. Sorry. No, and I'm not one of those anti-baseball people. I I love the the whole. There are so many aspects of baseball that I love. It's just so. Again, maybe this is all kind of still coming down from the Cavs' playoff run. But that was one of the most exciting times in Cleveland sports ever. Yeah. So, unfortunately, a slightly under 500 Indians team during the dog days of summer, I'd rather just take a break from sports in general for a little bit. With a front office that seems defensive. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, did you want to do the Mark Shapiro thing, or do you want to talk? Do you want to keep? No, along? no, I, we we can keep it going. We'll we'll find another way for me to yell at things. All right. So the, the <laughs> in the, in the absence of sports, well, uh, before before we move on from that, the one point I wanted to touch on in your um, the little article you did about the interview series and stuff like that, the the fact that. All he talks about, as you put it, were, oh, well, we're doing the best we can, market realities, blah, 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 blah. In terms of that being a sales job to people, you have to mention the goal is to win the World Series. And he never did that. He never said, our chances are slim, but I still think we can win the World Series. He just said... He's basically giving himself a, well, I never promised a World Series. But if that's really the point, if you're really running the team to be an ongoing, sustainable, mediocre business, and you're never challenging, then you're not the right guy for me. You know what I mean? Well, I don't want a guy to manage my expectations. I want a guy to let me dream impossible dreams. <laughs> you know, I, I, well, and, and, and I that's know that's cheesy. It's, it's like... I would rather have a guy who is slightly more slightly more reckless with things that at least is going to take a stab at it every once in a while. You know, it, like remember when they had their plans of oh every we can only contend every so many years because of that okay, that's market realities blah blah blah. But you have to have the plan for the once every 5 years you can strike. You've got to have that plan in place or else you shouldn't be a baseball team anymore. Right. If, if if your goal is to, well, we want to keep a positive, we want to stay in the black and 
you know, come in third every year and then we'll be great. It's like, no, that's not, that's not what your goal should be. Your goal should be to win the World Series at least sometimes. I understand you can't spend all out every year. I understand that. Not every year is your year. But, like, look at the Cavs. This year wasn't supposed to be our year. We made it pretty far. But when it got time to be, hey, I think we're pretty good, they went all in, as it were, and, you know, went for it. They could have sat down Kyrie Irving at the beginning of the playoffs and said, listen, he's pretty banged up. We're not going to win it this year. Let's save him for next year. But they didn't. You know what I mean? It's like much like to the talking. chagrin of Kyrie Irving's dad. Well, <laughs> you would have had to keep Kyrie Irving off the court with like duct tape. Like you'd have to tape him to his locker or something. They had to keep he, him on the court with duct tape. Well, that too. Splash. You had to keep his leg on. But you know what I'm saying? Like you can't always make the safe play year after year after year. Well, and that's that's the one thing is like the Indians have this pitching staff under control for a long time. Right. And that's that's a good thing. But uh you know the Tigers have uh, Verlander under control for a long time and he can't be Verlander anymore. So it just no to, guarantees. To waste some to waste an opportunity or to pretend like you can count on this being repeated year after year after year is really kind of not what I'm in for. You know, this, yeah, the, the this is one of those window years. The pieces don't just move when you move them. It's not a game of chess. Right. Just because you moved that piece there doesn't mean it still exists tomorrow because these are all humans playing a weird game. And with all the with all the negatives and all the complaining that I've done about the Indians, I still feel like this is a team worth investing in. This is a team that I can rally around. I think they need to be invested in. I think they need a front office to give them that boost of confidence that says, we think you can do this. We were willing to go out and make a deal. Well, and what do the players think of his yeah. managed expectations? Speech? That's exactly all, what I'm saying. They all read the paper. It's like, well, front office says that we're, we're the best we can do with the money. And he called out Carlos Santana. So I, it, let's not, I'm not going to pretend like – Shapiro well, didn't break his own mold a little bit and, and went out on a limb and criticized some players. I don't remember the Indians criticizing a player since um, since uh, Dick Jacobs called out Manny Ramirez the year uh, on the season before he left. I I the the other thing I won't criticize them on is like the Swisher thing, swing and miss, no problem. You yeah. know what I mean? You want to. You want to take big swings, you're going to miss sometimes. And so I'm never going to fault you for that. But taking check swings all the time, that's worse. You know what I mean? Right. Michael Bourne, don't have a problem with it. It was a good move on paper, and it hasn't panned out. But no move is worse than bad move in my view. Right, and you can't let a couple of bad moves – and I know they can't outspend their mistakes, but a couple of bad moves – can't keep you from going out and finding a ten million dollar player in trade now, right? Like if you can never be in a position as a major league franchise where a ten or a twelve million dollar player is standing in your way, because that's just what players cost, right? Like that's I, what that's I know. What that's major not league what caliber players cost. I know that's not what your own players when you give them long term deals and buy a couple years of free agency. I know that's not what they cost, but to trade at the trade deadline or sign in free agency, that's what they cost. Right. And you have, especially, you know, the Indians had some years where their payroll was in the 40 million in the 50 million in the 60 million. We've been, we've been waiting for this kind of, this kind of a, a, a thing, you know, and that doesn't mean that I want them to trade away every one of their farm players and mortgage the entire future, but there are strategic deals to be made with with teams that want to unload ten or twelve million dollar players. I'm sure of it. I don't know which ones because I don't do their job, and I, I, I don't, I can't be expected to do their job. But um, that's the bottom line: is that I think this is a team that's still worth investing in. 
and it I, I'll be very disappointed with this with the way this pitching staff is going if the Indians don't take some kind of a shot um, at you know maybe they do unload a Rayburn or a David Murphy just to clear the space to bring in some other guy and I'm fine with that but it better result in them bringing in a guy or uh, I don't even know who they could bring up but maybe. Maybe they waste some uh, some major league time on a young guy that they normally would have saved. The, every time they talk about saving somebody's major league time, it drives me nuts because you know whose major league time you're wasting? Kluber, right. Kipnis, Brantley. You're, for every minute you save on that young player, you're wasting uh, 20 minutes uh, of, of uh, actual uh, professional time on the major league roster. Well, and it's the same people who criticize the Browns for wasting Joe Thomas. Right. Uh, and, and I still – we've talked about it before. I don't understand the subdivided nature of Cleveland fans who you know, will hate on other teams. Indians to make fans theirs. have taken on the same personality as the front office and they get defensive. Yeah. Here's – I have one more criticism of the Indians and this is more lighthearted. Okay. Their radio is this, ads. Is this about Slider? No, because uh, is this about he went our, to Cincinnati. Is this, is this about friend of the program, Andre Not? <laughs> no, I, I I enjoy Andre's work. All right, good. This is about their radio ads. Okay. And it seemed like they went to an ad agency and they and they kind of told them what they wanted, uh, kind of a little paragraph. Then the ad agency came in and did the pitch meeting, and then someone in the front office just said, "Yeah, that's good." <laughs> And they're like, well, no, this is just a rough draft. You know, the Joe is a hardworking guy and he takes his family to the ballpark. That was just a rough draft. We're going to really punch it up and make it a little. No, no, just use that. That's all we need. Th- they just seem unfinished to me where they're like, oh, Steve hates his mom. So he goes to the ballpark to drink his problems away. Thanks, Steve. I, I just, I don't know. They-, they seem like they're unfinished ads to me. Yeah, I don't I don't know. It's I think they're fine. I think they're fine. I think what if was fine for the first year. <laughs> I, I I to me it's uh that's the I I have complained about those things in the past, but it's it yeah, this was mostly a, a jovial No, complaint. I know. I know. I'm I'm too I'm too serious and angry about the Indians. You saw you <laughs> you were in on the first drafts. Before, like when I was still angry, yeah. Um, <laughs> you saw the first couple of drafts of before I, I came out with the very reasoned, well, what I thought was a well reasoned post about the Indians. Uh, it was a hell of a post. There were a lot of angry versions first. I think I referred to some people as fart sniffers. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to really comment on specific. No, that's fine. <laughs> I was I was mad. I was mad, you know. <laughs> and if if that's the worst that anybody gets called out of all this fart sniffers, I think I <laughs> I anticipate that uh Mark Shapiro saw that and is seething to this day. Oh over man. It. I I wish just for a moment that I could live in somebody else's at mentions and and direct messages and see what that looks like. <laughs> oh, oh, it must be brutal. This guy has the gall to call me a fart sniffer. <laughs> yeah, that's my Mark Shapiro voice. That's what you missed. And you could have had that. Yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> oh, all right. Last but not least. So I, uh, I'm a bachelor this week. My, my wife and kids are out of town visiting family. And so I just need to well, – other than podcasting with you, sir. You know, I wondered why you pushed the podcast back to 10. Like usually we podcast at 8.15 once the kids are in bed. But Do you're you, living the bachelor life, staying up till 10. You want to know what I was doing? Watching a movie? Selfless, starring Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> and do you know why I chose that one? Ryan Reynolds have his shirt off or something? No, because I already saw the other two movies yesterday. I saw two <laughs> I double headered movies yesterday. I saw Ant Man in the afternoon and I saw Train Wreck in the evening and I said to myself 
selfless tonight. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> Is that on Netflix or something? Or Nope. Theater. Three times. Wow. I didn't know that was... I thought that was... Oh, I'm thinking of the other one where he makes his mind super good. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike mine. Oh, not- so did you enjoy them? How much popcorn did you have? I only ate popcorn at uh, Trainwreck, which was last night. No popcorn at uh, at Ant Man, and no popcorn. Although at the 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 cinema in Solon, there's a bar. So I had a beer while I was ah, watching Selfless. Nice. It's it's like take something that we're all very well used to and is not all that special and put it in a place where you don't expect it and you're like, oh my yep, God. Yep, then it's the best. <laughs> this is an oasis in the desert. They sell beer here. I've never seen beer. So uh, I, I must say that Selfless is probably not on my radar uh, as something I'm going to go see in a theater. Uh, definitely planning on seeing Trainwreck, I think, next week. Well, and I'm not going to spoil Selfless, but... Um, if but Ryan Reynolds does not take his shirt off in it? If anybody's seen the trailers, I'm just not going to respond to that. Um, if anybody's seen the trailers, you know that it's like a, a vice versa, out of body, switch, switch body kind of movies. And that is one of those genres that I've, my wife and I talked about it. I would see one of those every year. Huh. Um, the, the other one, The Purge. Jen and I decided we would watch one Purge movie every single year. We just love the concept. So the the switcheroo body thing, I'd watch that once a year. Time travel, I'd watch it once a year. So you are a fan of the 1988 Fred Savage, Judge Reinhold, vice versa. Who isn't? All right. Who isn't? Oh, yeah, that one's awesome. And then there's... um, Freaky uh, Friday. Freaky Friday. Uh, didn't Kirk Cameron do one? That's a good question. I Did he ever, <laughs> what about the Shaggy Dog? Does that count? Ooh, that's a good question. I think that might. I think that might fit in. See, that's that's the debate that uh, John and I have all the time on our. Like, wait a minute, is that a sports movie? There's some sports in it, but you know, Shaggy Dog. I'm going to give it to you because the interspecies body change. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, now I'm just trying to figure. Oh, like Father Like Son? Yes, like Father Like Son, Dudley Moore and Kirk Cameron. Wow. Man, that you might be too young for that. That was 1987. So by the time it made it to video, it was 89. I was 10. I was 9. So Okay, maybe. I was just think you're younger than me. A okay, lot younger so than me. I, I attempted... Uh, to Google uh, body switch movies. Ooh. And the first thing, as soon as I was done typing the word switch, it said body switch that works. As if someone is trying to do this. Okay, so we got big. Well, and I got to tell you that that's like one of the that's one of the storylines again, not a spoiler, but no that's spoiler. one of the storylines in uh, in Selfless is he keeps Google because in the movie it's called shedding, and so he keeps googling shedding, and pulls up like dog stuff. <laughs> that's of, an homage instead of what he's looking for. That's an homage back to the shaggy dog. That means it is a, <laughs> a straight up. You know that was in there. So you know what? We need to give a, a shout out to the original Body Switch movie. I not only saw the Shaggy Dog, but we had the Shaggy DA. <laughs> oh, 18 again. I remember seeing that one. George Burns movie. Oh, that counts too. Yeah, that was a good one. And I'll even count. This is why I like um, The Family Man with Nick Cage so much. Hmm. All right. And that's that. He doesn't even switch bodies, but he switches to a different life. But I still count it. Okay. You're gonna well, give this, it to me. I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, I was talking about the original Freaky Friday. Right. Not the not not the Lohan version. Correct. Body switch movies. Yeah, and big is obviously the the. That's the, yeah. the gold standard of body Absol- switch movies. Absolutely. 
because you can't you can't get a better performance i don't think than that one right none of the other ones are even close they're all kind of cheesy are there people who don't like tom hanks Mm, i don't know i have i mean i'm not saying that i love everything he's ever done yeah but i have i have a tough time i've also grown to hate uh um oh i can't believe i'm gonna forget this um and keep going I'm saying I can take any person and find a Tom Hanks project that they will like. Absolutely. I've grown to hate Forrest Gump. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, when you go back and watch it, those those effects are really obvious that they're fake. And it was it was special the first time, but it's it's in a long list of movies that I don't think has rewatchability. I know a lot of people would argue with me on that. Yeah, I I agree with you. Um and, uh, there are a lot of Oscar winners like that, especially uh like, do you know anybody who ever watched Slumdog Millionaire a second time? God damn it, I didn't. That's for sure. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, uh, that's that's true. And you've got... Uh, the majority of Best Picture winners are not rewatchable. Yeah, I agree with you. And especially when you, when you see uh, some of the things that lost, and you're like, wow, that turns out that was a way, way better movie. Right. And certainly sometimes you'll get an important film. I mean, I think uh nobody's For, okay. ever going to watch nobody's ever going to watch 12 Years a Slave twice. Well, to me the the key is But that doesn't reduce its value. How many people saw The Artist at I still all? I haven't seen it. Let alone would watch it again. Right. But then again, you know, so Birdman wins this year. I wouldn't watch that one again. No, that was an experience to watch, but I don't think I. there's much point of watching it again once but you've finished. Boyhood, I would watch Boyhood once every three or four years. I really like that movie. The King's Speech. I've never seen it all the way through. I've never seen it either. Uh, I'd watch Inception multiple times. I have seen that. I saw that three times in the theater. Um, oh boy see this uh 2009 you've got the hurt locker one okay here's one that didn't win how about the black swan or i'm sorry black swan you could never watch that a second time no no i see i'm just looking at 2009 hurt locker i don't know if it's really rewatchable avatar meh but then I've you've seen got that a million times, Avatar. Distri- District 9, Inglorious Bastards. There are a lot of rewatchable Up. movies on that list. Yeah. I would even rewatch Up in the Air, although I haven't. I like Up in the Air. Yeah, me too. Um, I, would n- I, I didn't see Precious. I didn't see Precious either. You know what? I did see Precious. I take that back. I did see Precious. You know I what? Wouldn't, I wouldn't watch it again. And see, now this podcast is just us scrolling through Wikipedia. But uh, 2007, No Country for Old Men, that's a movie that I haven't rewatched, but I should. Like, I don't know why I'm not. Oh, dude. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I should have rewatched that one. Um, in fact, I've wanted to rewatch that one. I've also wanted to rewatch There Will Be Blood and Juno. Um, but let's go back to let's go to 2008 again because I let mentioned... me just warn you about Juno. Uh-huh. The soundtrack gets annoying. Okay, <laughs> that's but that's okay. 2008. Advice. 2008 is the perfect year of unrewatchable movies. Oh yeah. Let me oh, let yeah. me go through the list for people. All right, I started off with Slumdog Millionaire, the winner. It is the most rewatchable of all the unrewatchable movies on this list. Second. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. After you see it once, you don't have to see that movie again. Did you see that one? No, but I know what happens. Backward aging super, Brad Pitt. super young. Yeah. Oh, um, man. And, all okay, right. continue. Frost Nixon. Wow. Would you ever watch that a second time? You probably I, didn't watch it the first time. I didn't watch it the first time. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Next up, this actually might be slightly rewatchable. Slightly, milk. But the problem is, is it's that kind of historical 
biopic or yeah. biopic, depending on who you are, right. that it's like, okay, now I know the story. There's not much rewatchable about it. Even a fabulous sports movie like Cinderella Man is like that. I would not rewatch that because it's right. a true story and now I know it. Right. But Caddyshack, you would because it's got jokes in it. Right. Last up, The Reader, as you mentioned. And I did see this movie. I did see this movie. I would never watch it again. It w- I even kind of liked it. But Well, and, and, and if I just do a little click here of 2008 in film, the rewatchable movies on the top ten highest grossing, The Dark Knight, very Iron Man. Very rewatchable. Wally. I've seen it seven times with my kids. I'm going to skip Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Cause I, would, it was, I would rewatch that. I don't care what anybody says. You like some LaBeouf? I don't mind LaBeouf. Whatever, Kung, Kung Fu Panda. Do you know LaBeouf did, uh, did a nude video for an Icelandic band called Sigur Rós? Uh, you don't have to say the Icelandic band part when you talk about Sigur Rós to me, but okay. Well, I, I guess it's not, listeners, it's not all about we're not you. just chatting right now. <laughs> uh, Hancock, that's watchable. I, you know what? I love that movie. So, yeah, thanks, Oscars, for picking crappy movies for your <laughs> best pictures. At least make it a rewatchable one. Yeah. For goodness sake. Now I'm, now I'm a, a 70-year-old wash woman saying, for goodness sake. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, lordy. For goodness sake. All right. I think that's where we stop. <laughs> so this Probably is this is idea. your dead sports week. He's Dave. I'm Craig. Please... Come to the Facebook page, say hi. Come to the Waiting for Next Year page, just say hi. Nothing else. Just say hi. Just let us know you're there. Um, you could do it on Twitter, too. He's at Dimoko, D-I-M-O-K-O, and I'm WFNY Craig. Let's keep the comments constructive, everybody. Yeah, just say hi. <laughs> All right, until next time, everybody, thanks for listening. Tell a friend. I got to go uh, watch The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants 2, also from 2008. I, I would, I would watch anything with with that girl in it, Joan of Arcadia. All right, good to know. <laughs> I always forget her name. Anyway, that's it. Thanks so much for listening. She's married to David Cross. Did you know that? Joan, I didn't. Know Joan that. of Arcadia married David Cross. I don't remember who that was. Who's Joan of Arcadia? <laughs> All right, you're gonna have to figure it out. Talk to you next <laughs> time, everybody. That's your spoiler. It's the Wavernexture.com podcast. <laughs>